How do you make sense of a year like 2020? It's no mean feat. Over the next hour, we'll be showcasing award-winning photographers from across the globe who've overcome enormous challenges to make some truly powerful work that's already sparking conversations on some of the most important issues of our time. And if, like me, you've wiped the entire last 12 months from your memory, fear not. I had a quick look at the photos before we started. Not a mask in sight. Instead, what we're offering you is an all-expenses-paid trip around the world. A memory of a simpler time, when we could travel freely and cough directly into each other's opened mouths. We'll be travelling from Zimbabwe to the Netherlands, from Mexico to Iran and beyond. Let's go. Luckily, it's not our work that's going to be showcased. These photographs are on another level in terms of their skill and brilliance. Each of the photographers is the recipient of one of the most important accolades in the industry, the Sony World Photography Awards. Their images were chosen from more than 330,000 pictures submitted from more than 200 countries across the awards four categories. Each picture chosen not just for its technical brilliance and visual power, but for the story it tells and for the fresh perspectives it brings to contemporary subjects. And we're going to be meeting the photographers and hearing first-hand accounts of their trials and capturing these bold images. It really is incredible in a year where most of us have been cooped up indoors that these brave artists have been out there getting creative and taking the risks to capture the stories behind these images. Images that are designed to provoke discussion and change perspectives. And if you're thinking, is that a photography pun? It was. I'm very funny. <laughs> That's right, we're going to be hearing from the next generation of up-and-coming photographers as well as seasoned professionals. And also showcasing the work of one artist who's been making a difference and an impact for more than 50 years, trying to really change and shape the visual culture of her native country. Let's start with images from a country that has some of the most striking and beautiful landscapes the entire world has to offer. Our first photographer has made a series of works from a small island nation that's been doing incredible things to bounce back from the 2008 financial crisis. Let's go to Iceland. E dopo aver conseguito una laurea in economia ho scoperto la passione per la fotografia e ho iniziato un percorso di documentazione che soprattutto negli ultimi anni mi ha portato a documentare la relazione tra uomo e ambiente. La prima volta che ho preso una macchina fotografica diciamo, ho trovato immediatamente naturale questo mezzo per provare a esprimere quello che vedevo. NetZero nasce durante la pandemia, nasce durante il lockdown e è un momento in cui ho cercato di fermarmi un attimo, pensare, studiare e sviluppare un, magari un approccio diverso verso un, un tema che non conoscevo così approfonditamente. Eh, io credo che il cambiamento climatico sia un problema di cui tutti nel nostro piccolo dovremmo farci carico. Simon, he chose the subject matter quite brilliantly. He twisted the outlook of this time and transit our idea from what we have caused in a negative sense to what we can do new um, in this time to solve the problems. A lot of people get so tired to see the negative aspects of the reality of human caused and now we need to think a bit differently. E il messaggio che volevo dare con questo lavoro è un messaggio positivo, un messaggio di speranza. L'Islanda è una piccola nazione che fino a vent'anni fa dipendeva dai combustibili fossili. In pochi anni ha cambiato completamente paradigma e passando all'utilizzo di energie rinnovabili al 100%. Well, amazingly, these are not stills from a science fiction movie. This is just what's going on in Iceland right now. These are um, 
I mean, these are kind of incredible photos. I mean, I learned so much just from reading about this. I didn't realise that Iceland at this point is getting 100% of its electricity from renewable sources. And I love the fact that Simone has chosen to celebrate that with these very striking images. It is incredibly unusual. Normally when we think of climate images, we think of either really dark, dirty industry or maybe of rewilded meadows. And he's yeah. done something halfway in between, hasn't he? Yeah. He's really laying bare the infrastructure of this clean industry and celebrating it, as you say, applauding it. And also that sci-fi reference, I think, is spot on. I mean, the image here of the geodesic dome is really amazing. That's all about capturing the waste material yeah. from the geothermal power power stations and reusing it again. So everything has been thought about, obviously, in these industries in Iceland. And the, the other picture that's hanging behind us at the moment, the Blue Lagoon, which is a lake that gets hot water from the runoff from a clean energy factory. I just, I love the juxtaposition of the kind of harsh, quite arid landscape. Then you've got this man-made power station in the middle of it. And then just some people having fun splashing around in the water. And the, I just found it really, geometrically satisfying this kind of three lines of the mist coming off the water the smoke coming out of the factory and the clouds in the sky it just feels like a very deliberate and nicely composed image and there's just so much joy in these photos and it's it's an incredible story with Iceland suffering so badly in 2008 from the financial crisis and choosing to rebound and not just get back to normal but to try and improve what normal is and that feels like something that's really inspiring and important given everything that we're all going through at the moment. And also for me, Simone's distinctive voice is about fusing his interest in economics. He did a degree in economics, first yeah. of all, before he became a photographer, with that really strong visual sense of what's going to make a story. And it's the fusion of those two things that obviously makes this series really distinct. Yeah, and I love the fact that for somebody who's taking an interest in economics and the climate crisis, he's chosen to tell a hopeful story of those two areas because I mean I certainly feel like all we hear is economic doom and gloom and climate doom and gloom and the idea that he's chosen to pick a more hopeful version of both of those two stories is really inspiring and optimistic. It's definitely one of the big positive stories I think of 2020 and of this particular country and what it's done with its economy uh, and with clean power. It's great. Well, a lot of the photographers we're talking about are people who have long established careers. Uh, however, some of them are at the very start of their careers. So let's look at the best of the submissions from the student programme. Nature, uh, farming, why I've decided to incorporate this in my photography is I grew up in it. Growing up on the farm, spending early mornings on the farm, being with these kind of people, it, it really made me love it. To know what South Africans are going through, so farming South Africans, and, and what it's like to farm here with the droughts, unpredictable climate, a lot of controversy around land, it, it makes it difficult. But I also want to capture those moments where you, know, you see the positive in it as well. It's not just something that I want to photograph, it's something that I care about deeply in my everyday life as well. And it's people that are close to me who are involved in this and they, those are the kind of people that I want to show the world. What stood out with these photographs was they were technically very, very well composed and he thought about how best to tell the stories from the perspective of, of those really looking to create a sustainable agricultural future. Personally, having Conrad as a winner is um, a fantastic achievement. I'm very proud. Um, he's a second year student, not a third year graduate, which uh, makes it even more prestigious. The photograph of the two boys from above on the horses, that is basically my childhood that I photographed in someone else. Me growing up with my Zulu friends, just riding donkeys and going crazy on the farm. I mean, that's, that's what it's like. I think photography is a powerful medium to speak for those who can't speak for themselves. If you look at photographers like David Goldblatt from South Africa who photographed you know, mundane moments during apartheid and uh, the people that he photographed that might not have had a voice otherwise, we have a responsibility to capture these moments, to tell these stories and to document them as moments in history so that we can keep them going forth and we can learn from them. 
Comrade's photographs, I think, are so interesting, aren't they? Because they, they're ostensibly about farms and farm workers, yeah. but really they seem to be much more about kind of growing up, responsibility, taking on the mantle of, of looking after the land and looking towards its future. Yeah, he's got an incredible sense of perspective for somebody his age. And having done some slightly creepy Instagram stalking, it, he's got a real distinctive aesthetic style. The way he treats the subject matter and even the colour palette, he, for somebody that age, it's amazing to have such a distinctive style and tone to the photographs. There's also that wonderful mix of intimacy. He really knows these people. Yeah. They're his friends, his relations. He grew up on a farm himself. Yeah. And yet he has this amazing ability to stand back and really see what's distinctive and special about their situation. And that's quite unique, I think. He seems to be sort of embedded within that community. This isn't somebody, this isn't an outsider coming to visit. This is something that definitely comes from his life and his experience. And the picture of the boy on the bed, HW, is, I mean, he, he was that kid. Sure. He, he knows exactly who he is. And it really caught something interesting in that where that boy is in his life at the moment. It's a kind of portrait and it's also, as much as anything, a self-portrait, isn't yeah. it? And you have HW with these amazing bloodshot eyes and looking slightly exhausted and sort of world-weary. Yeah. And yet the boyhood innocence and the slightly chubby cheeks still and yeah. the very narrow frame, he's just on that precipice, I think. Yeah. And there's something iconic, isn't there, about all of these images. Kunrad is obviously interested in turning everyday situations and people into iconic types. Yeah, he catches them with the reverence that you normally see somebody draw a superhero. You know, he, he really is elevating the people that he's grown up with and around into superheroes. For him, they really are symbols of the positive change it's possible to make on the future of South African society. Yeah, it had a real note of optimism through the whole thing, which is really nice and really interesting. I think my favourite photo was the overhead shot of the cows. I just thought for somebody who is a student and notionally still learning their craft, it was a really innovative and interesting way of approaching that photograph. These cows are obviously there, the cattle is all around him, but the ability to see in his mind's eye yeah. an amazing different shot by just changing the perspective, by getting above the scene, is something really special, I think. And he obviously he has wisdom and vision, I think, way beyond his years. So where next? Well, we're not going to go far, Nish. We are staying on the African continent because the next two photographers have been working there and really chronicling stories of vital importance. Often a story arises from a question that I can't answer. I start trying to understand and sometimes I get over overwhelmed by the story itself. Thinking photos is probably the last part. I had planned to travel to, to Africa in Kenya and uh, I started reading something about the country. I came into this plant, the Pyrethrum, that I never heard about. Until the 1970s, 80s, the production of organic insecticide went up and uh, Kenya was the biggest producer in the world. I went there with some, some ideas and I got in touch with a journalist that introduced me to the chief of agriculture there and then the rest is on the picture, I hope. The jury was most drawn into Vito's project, first and foremost because of the, the pictures themselves. They were a mix of portraits and still lives and environmental pictures and documentary pictures, and all together, it told a story. The idea behind this series of photos was to inform the world about this opportunity that this kind of uh, natural insecticide offer us. And also a way to, to inform the world about the stories of these farmers. I'm actually not coming from one of those families where photography was present. Accidentally, I found a camera and I started to experiment with it. It connected a lot, the language, with my personality, I think. 
I think my photography became more uh, intentional because I was trying to tell stories with my pictures. I actually discovered photojournalism and documentary photography and I started to work with reality as, as the main source of, of my inspiration. The year 2020, with all the confusion with the global pandemic, there was this very interesting thing happening in East Africa where a big invasion of locusts came to the country. And I found it uh, quite interesting because it were actually defining the world we are living nowadays. That was the pandemic, had an impact, and also climate change. I did several trips to the northern part of Kenya, trying to understand the implications also of the locust swarms in like, people's livelihoods. Lewis has engaged brilliantly with the local swarm story. He's obviously seen it as a human story and a nature story, and with sympathy for the people who, who live there, but also a sort of awe of the actual size of the swarms, which is what's so extraordinary. You really feel the energy of, of these swarms, their destructive power, and what it means to the people having to live amongst it. The scientists were saying that the locust invasion last year in Kenya was connected with climate change related events happening in the Indian Ocean. For me it's quite interesting to see how something that was happening in the other part of the planet was affecting regular small scale farming in Turkana. I think it's important for us to understand how globally we are all interconnected in this big challenge that is climate change. Two photographers operating under the theme of climate change and wildlife, taking photos in a similar part of the world, but they could not be more different in terms of content and technique. Is that fair to say? I think that's absolutely right. Luisa's photos showing us this incredible moment, these days in the midst of the locust invasion in Kenya, the worst the country has seen in over 70 years. Really powerful images of the terrible devastating effects of climate change. And then we have Vito showing us, in a way, the flip side of the climate story, which is how communities can turn it around into something positive when they have the natural resources that allow them to do that. That's right, these are the pyrethrum flower that uh, is actually a naturally occurring pesticide that we stopped using in the 1980s when it was replaced with man-made chemicals that are cheaper to produce. But even technically, I mean, these are quite different styles of photography going on. I mean, this feels almost sort of embedded photojournalism in some ways. And these two amazing images, in a way, both of man against nature. Yeah. Here, an incredibly moving image of a farmer who's already, we know from what Luis tells us, he's lost his livelihood to cattle raiding. Now he's just at that moment where he's looking at these awful pock marks on the maize leaves and realising, I think, that the future for him and his 10 children has been completely sidetracked by this awful invasion. And then here, this wonderful, arresting image, really iconic, the single man against nature, almost from the eye of the storm itself. Whereas these images, I mean, it's more celebrating man in collaboration with nature. And on a technical level, Vito said that they're semi-staged and you can see that there's a sort of clear attempt to build a connection between the photographer and the subject. And they, um, this is celebratory images, but they're also, I mean, posed is possibly the wrong word, but he certainly set something up to try and capture the engagement that he's felt with the subject and a lot of them were born out of interviews that he conducted. That's right and again two photographers both getting deeply embedded with the communities they're working with but coming up with very different approaches yeah. and I think that's really interesting is that we see here two photographers who are working in very different ways but very much out in the world and bringing the stories back home to us. The next two photographers we're going to look at have actually managed to make spectacular images from the comfort of their own homes. I love experimenting and I like process. So I'm always messing around with photography, whether it be analog or digital photography, experimenting with materials and software. That often will lead me into an area of subject matter and over time that will develop or not. I need to just continually work on my personal work, otherwise I will never produce any of these projects. My father got me interested in the space program very early on. He was always crazy about these 
the Mercury program, the Apollo program, and he'd take me outside to show me if a satellite was flying above or whatever. I've never really lost that interest. There's something that's always fascinated me. When the photography and video imagery from NASA became available, it's copyright free. You get these raw, unprocessed files. I just knew I was gonna do something with them. So I kind of messed around with them for a really, really long time. And then one day I just hit on this thing where I put 3D content in and I could just see this idea develop. One of the aspects of Mark's work that I loved the most was his mix of humor as well as very serious topics all mixed together. Um, and that's, that's hard to do. And that was what was so exciting in such an innovative, creative way. I could see quickly that there was an opportunity for me to make comments about the time, about the era that these were happening, about the fact that most people think that the moon landings may have been a conspiracy. And it's pretty apt now because so many people are conspiracy theorists about the coronavirus, about you know Donald Trump, all sorts of stuff like that. So I could see a link. I think it's a very simple messaging format that I came across sort of by accident. Perspective, an important device for storytelling in the world of photography, but also a powerful tool for manipulation. <gasps> we might view photography as a tool for capturing real life, but don't underestimate its power to distort the truth. Barbecue on the moon? Sure, why not? Are these images real? Of course they're not. They're not. We're legally obliged to tell you that they're not. But in the darkest corners of the internet, people still argue over the veracity of the original images taken and shared by NASA. Stanley Kubrick in a film set, apparently. Go figure. Mark's images play with these notions of conspiracy theories, but also invest mundane objects with more interesting backstories. Even a suitcase looks exciting if it's on the moon. But can these images be made to look alien? A photographer in the Netherlands may have found a way. I've been in the photography industry for more than 30 years and in some parts I was a photographer, especially in the beginning and later I was involved in sales. I've done aerial photography in, in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia. My expertise grow every, every year with different type of processes. So now I'm actually back to, to, to square one which is done in the analog photography. It, it's a process from 1851, and I really like that. It, it's exciting all the time, and you never really know if it's gonna happen, if you're gonna get a good plate. Peter's photographs stood out for me simply because they're beautiful. They're really a stunning series of images. What I really liked about them was the fact that although it's a very traditional process, they really looked very contemporary. They look very handmade. The process is really technical, it's very complicated. There's lots of layers to making these and so many things that can go wrong in making these images. So that idea of them being handmade was really important to me and their uniqueness. Once I find an object or objects, I imagine the picture in my head. Mostly that happens during the night. And then in the morning when I wake up, I make a drawing. And then I create that image here and, and try to take it on, on, on wet plate. And the wet plate is really interesting because you never really know what's going to happen. But something is going to happen and that's the exciting bit. Now, these are very cool. These definitely, Nish, are two brilliant photographers. Both art photographers but working in really, really different ways. Yeah. So we've got Mark, in a way, at the most digital end of the spectrum, manipulating images on the computer screen, and then Peter at, in a way, the most analogue end of photography, going back to this early photographic process, wet plate collodion photography. I love the detail in what Mark's done in terms of inserting these mundane objects into the moon landing photos. And I really respect the attention to detail of not just putting the barbecue in, 
but actually putting the reflection of the barbecue into the astronaut's helmet. You know, that, that's a level of commitment that absolutely blows my mind. You can totally imagine him, can't you? I think sitting at the computer screen, pouring away for hours, enjoying, savouring every detail. With Peter, I think that effort, that process goes in right at the beginning. You know, he's got to get his glass plates, he's got to coat them with the chemicals, he's got to make them light sensitive. And then as he says, the actual taking of the picture is quick and dangerous and risky. One plate, one chance. So I love that total contrast in the way they're making their images, but both incredibly artistic. Yeah, and I love the fact that Mark put so much time and thought into something that is shot through with so much humour. There's, you know, the use of the barbecue, the mundane objects. I mean, even the insertion of the coronavirus protein, there's a mischievous sense of play at work, linking COVID and the moon landings, two enormous stories, both of which have had massive impacts in the conspiracy theory community. It's an interesting juxtaposition, but then in some of the other work in the same collection, it's satirical, but much more serious and intent. You have an astronaut wandering amongst these kind of M16 rifles that are made to look like crosses. So you have this sense of a soldier's graveyard. He's basically refracting the whole of late 20th century and early 21st century history through the moon landings. And also on top of that satire, lots of really clever artistic references yeah. back. So you've got references to pop art, you've got references to early conceptual art and Duchamp. And that, again, for me, makes their work similar in, a, in approach because Peter also is looking back, not just to very early photography of the 1850s, which is now back in vogue, but also, I think, to things like 17th century Dutch portraiture and still life. The, the images are so austere and severe, and it's such an interesting thing to see two people who have spent so much time and produced something that they couldn't be more divergent in what they end up with. Absolutely. But. Mark and Peter's work shows us that the state of art photography is in a very, very healthy place right now. Yeah, and both these photographers take everyday objects and imbue them with things that we might not spot. But I'm interested in the idea of if you can take an everyday object and make it into something monumental. Like, for example, this chair. Can you make this chair monumental? This, this specific chair, Nish? This chair, chair like it. Just chairs. Well, anything's possible. Oh. Our next photographers engage with exactly this question as they seek to add the extra to the ordinary. It's been 20 years since I've been here. In the year 2000, I started with a compact analog camera. نگاه جستجوگری که من الان به عکاسی دارم قطعا 20 سال پیش نداشتم. من سعی میکنم با اکسام به یک درک صحیحی از محیط اطرافم برسم. فضای خالی از انسان. داستان این مجموعه محله های سکوته که سکوت حاکم بر فضا رو نشون میده. سال 2020 یکی از کمکارترین سالهای زندگی هنری من بود. با توجه به شرایط قرنطینه من خیلی سال 2020 کمتر کار کردم و بیشتر اکسای سالهای گذشتم رو مرور کردم و مجموعه جدیدی رو ویرایش کردم. I found Majid's series really interesting because it was landscape but it was about the absence of people. Even though it was a very kind of traditional dramatic viewpoint it was very evocative and surreal because it was actually slightly subverting the idea of what landscape was because he was actually commenting on the absence of human life. Majid used photography to engage with the subject matter by using traditional tropes in photography such as composition and symmetry, natural light and colour and form, but in a kind of slightly unexpected manner. I really loved one of the photographs where he had a cloud perfectly sitting on top of this little hut and also another one which was very dramatic and it had a big rock with this very bizarre set of cinema seats it looked like, which always made you question what was going on. من خیلی خوشحالم که مجموعه که در ایران کار کردم در بود جهانی دیده میشه. My parents gave me the first camera 
When I was 12 years old, a very simple Russian 35 mm camera. I don't usually plan my photo shoots too much. I trust my heart and I follow my feelings. I believe in empathy. I try to adapt to the surrounding atmosphere and to be a part of it. And then I want to express my feelings through a visual language of photography. The former Drnov military complex has been empty for 17 years since the army left it. Two friends bought it to fulfill their dream of building a final resting place for pets called Eternal Hunting Ground. While I was taking the photos of Eternal Hunting Ground, the strongest moment for me was to see the soft ethereal glow coming from the minimalistic morning hall. That was the place where I realized how equal to us are pets in our minds. We have very close emotional relationships with our animals and that link between design and spirit, almost like a modern church, beautifully captured with this story. It captured that sense of calm, peace and loss and also slight wit around it as well. It's the story about the paradox of loneliness in the crowded world because the closest and most loved partner for many people is a dog or a cat. But it's also the story about the amazing world where we could change the former Cold War army facilities into the pieces of the art and architecture. Um, I know we've uh, said that we're trying to take people out of the events of the last 12 months where possible, and I don't think it's on purpose at all, but these two photos particularly are extremely 2020. You know, the sort of abandoned objects has really reminded me of what you see out of a car window or when you're walking through the park, especially the bench, the kind of abandoned objects, the evidence of life without the actual seeing of people living it. What catches his eye, it seems to me, is the incongruous, the unexpected, and sometimes, frankly, the surreal. You know, you've got this uh, abandoned phone box in the middle of a field, and he's talked about how he's interested in silence and in human absence and presence. You definitely get a sense here, of course, that there were people here, there was some activity, that's now over. The same with the bench, as you say, this kind of bench and mural, a bit like a border between kind of the modern world and the landscape. And I love the details though, things like here, he's sort of told us that that's the Persian word for love. And just behind it in the background on this metal pole, you've got two pigeons kind of courting each other. So he's got this lovely eye, I think, for detail, but also for the kind of surreal, unusual moment. And you, see, so you sort of see these objects and he it has a fascination with the marks that people have left on inanimate objects. And you can see the sort of chipping of the paint and the sort of damage that's done. And it's almost the kind of, evidence of life. Whereas Tomás over here has looked at something very different because it's something where people have actively intervened to, with the architecture because this is actually an amazing story about two friends who took a former military complex about half an hour outside of Prague and have turned it into a cemetery for pets and have taken something that you know is quite a severe Soviet looking piece of architecture and covered it in mirrors and turned it into a kind of gaudy, almost like glam rock art installation that ultimately takes something that was quite a symbol of oppression and turns it into something celebratory about the lives of the beloved cats and dogs that people have had. I'm really interested in those two approaches. I imagined looking at the evidence of life that we accidentally leave and Tom Ash looking at something where we very much directly interfered with an object. There's something about minimalism, it feels to me, in both of these photographers' work. Tom Ash worked with the minimalist architect, Peter Hayek, and there's a very spare feeling to his images, vertiginous, strange views, but very sort of calm, quiet, again, a kind of silence there, a human absence. So they're both working in similar ways, but, but with very, very different effects and very, very different stories, in a sense, behind their projects. So Nish, uh, abandoned phone boxes, empty benches, does that answer your profound question about the chair as object? I think it does. I think it does. 
Well, our next photographer is much younger, working at a much earlier stage of her career, but she's already made some really breathtaking work. She submitted a single image in the open competition, which seeks out the very highest quality single picture from anywhere in the world. Yeah, that's right. I mean, most of the photographers we've been looking at so far have submitted a collection or even in some cases a whole body of work. Distilling everything into a single image, that's a whole different challenge. Let's find out how she got on as we journey to Zimbabwe to look at the work of Tamari Kudita. To photograph is to frame, and to frame is to exclude. So I look at excluded narratives that you wouldn't see in academic textbooks. In our African culture, the stories that we were told by our grandparents were recited to us. They weren't written down. My work is a visual depiction of oral history. When I created African Victorian, I was paying tribute to the contemporary being who is also rooted in history. And the African elements that I use, they've been filtered through a Western medium as a way of showing an affinity with the multifaceted identity. My model's African dresses have been reconfigured into Victorian gowns as a way of inverting the power index by the Victorian dress. Ver esta esta foto que fue seleccionada, empezás a encontrarte a través de la vestimenta y de la conexión entre la cámara y la y la mirada que tiene directa la la, la protagonista de la foto con el fotógrafo. Hay como un algo en el paisaje, en el fondo que hay, en la chocita. Hay como diferentes cosas que te hacen conectar. I use clothing as a way of unpicking inherited binaries that affect our understanding of difference of the post-colonial identity. I also bring forward old century poses as a way of allowing my models to assert their rightful place in history. So Tamari's image, what an incredible, iconic shot. It takes a lot, it seems, from the conventions of fashion photography, the dress, the hairstyle, the props, this very strong pose, but she actually calls it an environmental portrait. And I think there is a huge amount more going on under the surface. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even to the untrained eye, like these bad boys, I can spot the, the conventions of fashion photography. Just from seeing magazine covers, I, I understand that this is something that's deliberately existing within those parameters and is taking them on and then sort of subverting them as well. And I, I love the contrast of this very traditional regal Victorian dress and the very traditional Shona cooking implements that she's holding. Yeah, I mean, I really loved what Tamari said about photography as well and what she seems to have such a clear sense of a mission and there's a kind of precision in every single element of this image and there's a precision in what she wants to achieve in photography. For someone who is incredibly young really at the beginning of her career she's got this amazing gravitas and seriousness of purpose about the power of photography about where she sits within that history particularly I think about the history which as she says is still unwritten mostly of black women photographers. I mean this is an iconic image of black female empowerment yeah. also the blending of the two cultures the show the culture, the Western influences, which, as she says, is very personal to her because she has those two histories in her own background. Yeah, it's um, there's a huge amount of autobiography clearly coming through in this, and I love what she said about um, the idea that photography, by its very nature, requires framing, and framing, by its very nature, forces you to exclude some things. And certainly, she's desperately trying to move the frame of photography to cover things that it has excluded in the past. And yeah, I think everything about her and everything about this image just screams a kind of composed precision. She knows exactly what she wants to achieve. And that is fantastic and exciting and really inspiring in somebody her age as well. And also to communicate so much through a single image, I think is an incredible skill to have. This yeah. is a very, very powerful image, a very future-facing image of the black woman. Yeah, it's great.
This is great. I mean, we've already hit we've already done more traveling than i ever thought possible in a pandemic we've been to iceland we've been to iran now we're in zimbabwe i can't wait to see where we go next well, i think where we're going next is back closer to home back to the uk it's definitely downstairs follow me i feel like one of the biggest things that i'm learning as we go around this thing is the sort of number of different types of photography there are you know there's kind of documentary photos but also art photos and fashion photos there's so much more to it than I previously would have thought I think that's right and then you get photographers who are working on a whole different load of projects but still have a really distinctive look and photographers working across personal and professional projects like the next two we're going to look at right. I didn't really get into photography until I was studying at St Martin's. I was doing a foundation course, um, but my first experience with photography was when I was very young because my father's a photographer. He would have a TV with uh, cartoons playing and put a red filter over it and he'd just pop me on a stool and he'd be working in the darkroom. So I, I remember the smell of the chemicals, I remember sort of being around photography. With each kind of project or with each picture that I take, I guess I really try and embrace vulnerability, immerse myself in the moment, and ultimately it has to be about play. I have to be enjoying what I'm doing. And I think it's also quite reflective of the mood that I'm in. So for example, there may be times when I'm just not in the mood to engage with another person, and I might just want to go out and photograph things or light. Um, and then there may be other times where I just have a chance encounter with somebody. Um, and that for me is a really precious exchange. Laura has a great way of capturing emotion in her portraits. She uses the body language of the subject to evoke the emotion that the subject matter is feeling. And in other times, it'll be a much more close up where you can see the facial expressions. And I think that's very powerful in photography as opposed to always only using the eyes or the mouth. When I'm looking at art, the most important thing for me is that I feel something when I look at it and I have an emotional reaction and I really hope that my work speaks to people and they feel a connection with it. Ideally if I'm taking a portrait I would love the connection that I have with the person that I'm photographing and that relationship just to be instantly kind of translated through to the person so they feel like they're looking at who I'm photographing and they're having their own connection. دائما في سوريا نقوم بتصوير القتل والدمار والنزوح لان هذا الذي يحصل بشكل شبه يومي نتيجه الحرب هنا احاول دائما التركيز على الانسان على الاطفال لانهم اكبر ضحيه نتيجه هذه الحرب احاول التركيز على قصصهم ونقل الوجه الاخر للحياه هنا بعيدا عن القصف والقتل والحصار والتهجير بدأت بتصوير قصة عندما كنت في زيارة لأحد مدارس ذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة في بلدة الجينة في ريف محافظة حلب فشاهدت المدرب وسيم ستوت وهو يقوم بتدريب أطفال على الكاراتيه خلال حصيلة الرياضة يقوم بتدريب أطفال لديهم إعاقات مع أطفال سليمين في محاولة منه لتقديم دعم نفسي لهم ودمجهم مع بعضهم البعض لفتت نظري قصة المدرب وسيم والانسجام والسعادة التي لاحظتها على وجوه الأطفال هناك. For me, I think you, you don't really notice Anas. He's amongst the children. You feel as though you're part of it as a viewer. And I think that's really important. But clearly, he's really considered where he is when he's taking these photographs. If you look at the sight lines, the, the doors, the mats on the floor, it's all very, very carefully considered. But equally, he's managed to capture the sense of movement. You really felt that the children were engaging and, and enjoying what they were doing, but he was in the midst of it all. These are some of the most extraordinary photos we've seen today. I mean, this is the work of two people who have managed to find the human story behind stories that we might read about in the news and things that are often written about in abstracted terms suddenly become very real 
and very, I don't want to say relatable, but certainly help build empathy with the people behind a lot of the headlines that we read. I think empathy is a really key word, Nish, because particularly for Laura, she's all about wanting to draw out the honesty and the raw reality for her subjects, for her portrait subjects. And she's talked about how she spends usually more than a year working with people to really get herself into their lives, gain their trust, and then be able to capture these moments, as she calls them, the kind of in-between moments of photography. So Baruch, for example, yeah. an amazingly intimate moment just as he's waking up. And she was interested in him because he was at this threshold in his life, trying to consider maybe breaking away from his very devout religious closed community and emerging into the world and experiencing things for the first time. Then you've got Jack, uh, one of the kids she met uh, around a council estate in Birmingham, which again she visited numerous times, really befriended the children there and she captures this wonderful moment just as the sun is setting where he's got a lollipop in his hand and a cigarette in the other just on the precipice between boyhood and manhood really intimate wonderful pictures yeah it's an incredible photo and you know if you think about how casually headlines are written about kids on council estates it's really she's really trying to give a sense of what the actual people are that are involved in that and i mean in a similar way anas is made an extraordinary collection and the title of the collection really gives you all you'd really need to know about the overarching themes of it which is sport and fun not war and fear and he's taken photos in this karate class where this teacher teaches kids of different ages and also kids with special needs and has highlighted the joy that exists in the day-to-day -day moments in Syria between the harsher moments that inevitably come with the conflict and Anas is a photojournalist and he has spent a lot of time documenting what's been happening in Syria. But what I love about this is that he's chosen to highlight the little moments of joy and mischief that exist between the kids in the karate school. And particularly, I don't know about you, Nish, but I look at these images and I hear sound yeah. kind of flooding totally. out from them. You hear the sound of kids smashing themselves on the rubber mats and chatting away and giggling. And it's, it's laughter that is the predominant sound here, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. He, he has this great faculty for catching the kids in the middle of expressing some element of mischief or joy. He's, he's really great at catching them as they're about to express something. And it really, you're absolutely right, it's so evocative of being surrounded by a gaggle of noisy kids. And again, it's a, he's managed to find real human moments amidst a huge amount of suffering. Well, talking of human moments, Nish, the next photographer we're going to take a look at has been capturing human moments for more than half a century. And she's the incredibly worthy recipient of the 2021 Sony World Photography Award for outstanding contribution to photography. Yeah, previous winners of this award include Martin Parr, Candida Hoffer, Mary Ellen Mark, Nadav Kanda and William Eggleston. And this year's winner joins that illustrious list of people who have left a real tangible mark on the world of photography. Let's take a closer look at the work of Graciela Iturbide. Yo fotografío por la sorpresa y por la emoción. Yo fotografío lo que realmente me, me produce una emoción y es cuando ap ap aprieto el gatillo de la cámara, pero solamente cuando tengo esta sorpresa y esta emoción. Sí quería ser directora de cine, pero al estar en la escuela de cine en la universidad, eh, me di cuenta la cámara es muy pesada para, para que una mujer trabaje. El equipo de gente que te necesitaba ayudar. Y como conocí a Álvarez Bravo en esa misma escuela, decidí dedicarme a la fotografía. Por supuesto que el cine, no la escuela del cine, sino el cine en general, ha influenciado de una manera increíble a mi fotografía. Eh, México es mi país. La fotografía ha sido un pretexto para poderlo conocer bien, para conocer su cultura, para estar cerca más de la gente. Hablar de Graciela Iturbide es hablar de la fotografía latinoamericana. Es un ícono, un ícono de, de nuestra fotografía. Es una representante inigualable, diría. Para mí es la, una de las 
mejores fotógrafas que tiene el continente en esa, en esa cuestión. Es una mujer con una sensibilidad distinta, diferente, que a lo largo de su carrera ha, ha trabajado, ella está por, por cumplir 79 años y está súper vital y jovial. Creo que soy muy egoísta. Tomo las fotos para mí misma. Nunca pienso si las voy a exponer, si voy a hacer un libro, si qué va a pensar la gente de ellas. Evidentemente que cuando tengo buenas opiniones me da gusto, pero cuando salgo a fotografiar solamente pienso en mí eh, y en mi comunicación con la vida. Jackie, I'm embarrassed to say that uh, the only reason I was familiar with one of Graciela's photos was because it was used by Rage Against the Machine for a single cover. It's not my most highbrow moment. But actually, that's a really good point, that we are incredibly familiar with the images of so many of these outstanding photographers, and yet they're not household names. Yeah, and her work is absolutely extraordinary. And I mean, I was particularly drawn to the images of the indigenous women that she photographed in places like Oaxaca in Mexico. And these are societies where often they're matriarchal, so the women are financially and sexually independent. And it was obviously a subject of great fascination to her. You really feel that the passion of her life is Mexico. She's traveled the world, she's photographed all across Latin America, but it's the people, the places, the sights, the smells of Mexico that she keeps coming back to. And the style of the photography, the black and white, photos, the use of the shadow, it's very sort of dramatic and feels very cinematic in its execution. Cinematic I think is true, I mean we know that she has looked a lot at Italian neo-realist cinema and also at the history of Latin American visual arts and photography and all of that visual culture you feel percolates through each of these images. Our final photographer is a multi-award winner who was already shortlisted for two categories in this year's Sony World Photography Awards. He was voted the overall winner in the portraiture section and has been voted as the overall photographer of the year. Let's head to Blackburn in the northwest of England and discover more about the work of British photographer Craig Easton. I've been a photographer for 30 years. And I, I came to photography through an interest in, in sort of current affairs and, and uh, news. So for me, photography was always about documenting society. I mean, I see myself as much as a sort of historian, as a photographer. I'm, I'm making work that will be looked at in generations to come, I hope. I've been working in and around Northern England and, and the representation of Northern communities for a long time. And then Sophie Skellen at Blackburn Museum was running a project called Kick Down the Barriers that was in response to this portrayal of Blackburn as the most segregated town in the UK by the BBC Panorama. Another artist who was involved in that project, a writer and social researcher, Abdul Aziz Hafiz, we, we just hit it off and we started collaborating and working together. And so, so the final piece of work is, is very much a collaborative thing where the photographs and the words sort of play off each other and I hope add layers to, to the, the story we're trying to tell. Do you see me? What do you see? Do you see the trial and the strife, the sweat of my brow? Uphill the struggles on Saunders Road, near but far from Duke's Row. It's a set of portraits and it comes about because everybody's got stories. Documentary photography for me is about that, it's about listening to people. A picture that springs to mind is Muhammad Afzal um, with his pigeons. He'd agreed to do the picture and then when we did finally get together, he turned up straight from work and he had all his dirty work clothes on. And I immediately thought, as a photographer would, well, this is ideal, it's full of texture and it's great. But he wanted to go and get changed. So he went and showered and came back looking all spruced up. And of course, he was absolutely right to do that because the picture was much better for it because it allowed him to present himself in the way that he wanted to be presented. Craig shot everything in black and white, but he also infused everything with these very warm tones. So there was a sense of a very traditional black and white portrait but with this very kind of fresh approach. The best portraits are often is about getting a sense of how they live. You're not necessarily seeing their soul, you don't know what they're thinking, but Craig's work puts him in a situation that makes you understand 
the community they're from, so it's very, very human. All the subjects in his photos were seemingly made in quite a slow tempo. So the subjects, they gaze at the camera and they pose for an image. So all the images are so classical and grounded. Craig's really interested in what's happening in the world and he really cares about the people that he takes the images of and the communities that he works with. He's very sensitive about the way he deals with that. He's not trying to, to make it into a spectacle and I really respect the way that he works in that way. The, the work we did in Bank Top, really it's about challenging one-dimensional portrayals of northern communities. It's also part of, of me learning about my own understanding. And, you know, a, a great hero of mine, Paul Strand, uh, described photography for him as an instrument of research. And I feel that that's my approach too. So Craig's work is all long-term documentary projects that are very much focused around social policy, around issues of identity and particularly a real sense of place. And this project, which he worked on in collaboration with the writer and academic Abdulaziz Hafiz, clearly has a very strong political intent and there's a real urge to fight stereotypes that are often perpetuated in the media about Blackburn in the northwest of England being a segregated town. Um, and they're actually trying to fight those quite actively by portraying integration and the communities working together. There's also a real sense of the legacy of post-colonialism and Blackburn's a place that went through a huge amount of changes in the Industrial Revolution and then post-industrialisation has been subject to a lot of different changes as well. These photographs show the complexity of this place and how so much of what's going on today is not just about race, but actually it's about, as you say, those legacies and the much more burning issues for most people of things like unemployment and housing and social deprivation. And there's also a real intimacy to the images. I mean, the, the physical proximity to some photographs like this, it, it really, it, it's very arresting. This picture particularly, I think, of Mohammed Afzal, known as the Birdman of Banktop. This is a man who works incredibly hard six days a week in the poultry slaughterhouse. Sunday afternoon when Craig took this photograph, that's the one moment of the week where he gets an opportunity to be himself, change out of his work clothes and have some free time. There's something amazingly timeless about this image. You really feel he could be this could be the face of a Victorian mill worker from 150 years ago. Yeah. And that incredible mix of confidence, self-assuredness, but also deep wariness of us and our gaze and why we're looking at him and how we might be judging him. I think it's brilliant. Well, this collection brings together the idea of photography as a medium for storytelling, of building human intimacy and sending out very strong political messages. And so in many ways, it's the perfect way to wrap things up. We said at the start of the hour that we would take you on a journey around the world and I hope you'll agree that with these photos we've been able to do just that. We've explored the landscapes of Iceland, witnessed the stories of people living in Kenya, we've even been to the moon and we finally answered the age-old question, can a chair be monumental? Answer yes. Through it all we've proven that powerful stories are happening all around us, close to home and thousands of miles away. It's been truly inspirational to see how these photographers, all from very different moments in their careers, have been incredibly creative in responding to the challenges of the last year. I can't wait to see what the next 12 months bring. Hey, I may even branch out from taking photos of something other than my food. <laughs> Definitely no more bread photos from me, I promise. The future of photography is in safe hands, just not ours.